Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is Friday, so happy Friday. Um, it is the last day of colloquium week. Um, we've had a really good set of, of, of presentations across a broad range of topics, and we've had um, a lot of good turnout. So um, I'm happy that colloquium week um, seemed to have been a success for our faculty members. As we come on our final day of colloquium week, we're sort of continuing a little bit with our um, topic of retention, uh, burnout, and um, you know, folks remaining in the profession after they have uh, spent a lot of time being educated, you know, and earning a degree, um, and then to somehow within the first, you know, two, three, five years, uh, a significant portion of our workforce leaves, and it happens in every profession. I actually heard an entire news item yesterday talking about just burnout in general. Um, and it wasn't within the medical field where you would typically expect that right now, you know, because of the pandemic. Um, and so yesterday's focus was on uh, retention in the nursing profession. And today's focus will be on retention in the uh, teaching profession and variables that can affect why teachers leave or stay um, in that profession. So I'll just turn this over to Dr. Singh real fast and let her be able to uh, initiate her presentation. Good morning, everyone. I am, uh, my name is Dr. Nalini Singh and welcome, welcome to the presentation. Welcome to the last day of the biannual research curriculum. So I, I know Kay is on and Nina is on. I don't see too many other people in my screen. So I just wanna welcome you all to my home because um, that's where I am. And, um, and I hope you enjoy this presentation and please, I would love for it to be interactive uh, as much as we can. I, I would love to share what I know and my experiences, but please ask questions and um, so we can have more of a dialogue rather than you having to listen to me speak for an hour. So um, welcome again and, and I will begin. So, so my study is on the effects of principles, emotional intelligence, EQ, leadership, toxicity, school and school culture on teacher self-efficacy. Um, again, my name is Dr. Nalini Singh, and I am an adjunct at Aspen University uh, in the School of Arts and Science. And thank you for having me here today. So what is today's learning objectives that I would love for you to walk away with? Um, it's what is emotional intelligence? Why is it so important? And, and I would like to share my study and why is my study so important? Why did I spend three years doing this and, um, and speaking here today and sharing it to the world? And, and hopefully as we continue to grow, do other things with this, but, but why is that? So this is my learning objective for today that I would like to share with you. And I hope, and I hope that you can walk away with knowing what e EQ is and why is it so important? Um, so let's get started. Who am I? So, oops, sorry. So who am I? I am an educator. I, um, I love empowering staff and students alike. I, I've spent over a third, I've been 15 years as leadership, but I've been in the system for over 30 years. And, and also it came from more within. Um, my mom always said education is something that can never be taken from you. Education is something that lasts with you forever. People can take whatever you, you have, but they can't take your education. So that stays with me. And I try to uh, put that over uh, on a daily basis in my role as um, an educator. I have a B an MA in school administration um, and I received that from Toro College. And I also have an EDD from St. John's and my EDD is in administrative and instructional leadership. Um, I also have, a, of course, um, I am an IB program. I did a, a course in IB and I am certified in that. So all of this helps me to be who I am and be that educator that I strive to be on a daily basis. I've also spent 15 plus years in a leadership role in the U New York City Department of Education and um, I enjoy that work as a principal at Antonia Pantoja Preparatory Academy. I'm a principal of first a grade six to 12 school. And um, in New York, 
and I, I work with over 60 plus staff. Um, it's one of the smaller schools that we have um, created in about, I think it was about 15 years ago when the schools were collapsed into smaller schools. So my school is, has about 400 plus students. In addition to that, I am also an adjunct professor at Aspen University and in the School of Arts and Science. And I really enjoy that role. I teach uh, diversity and culture, and I really enjoy that, uh, you know, because education is in my blood. It's in my DNA. It has become that way. But in addition to being an educator, I am a mom. I have one daughter and I am a nana. And um, I have four grandchildren, three boys and one girl. And I really, you know, that is probably my best pastime is spending time with my family. It really is um, fulfilling. I, I love to read, go for long walks and bike ride. So that is me, that is who I am. And you see a picture of me and you hear my voice. So that's who I am. Um, in sort of a, a quick summary of myself. So today uh, we'll talk a little bit about emotional intelligence, but how can we spot emotional intelligence in leaders? And I, I picked this because I thought this was a little, um, you know, tongue in cheek here. Yes, I think I have good people skills. What kind of idiot question is that? And is that really uh, someone with emotional intelligence? So I thought it was a good place to start, a little bit of humor, and um, to just get us going. So, um, so let's talk a little bit of what exactly is emotional intelligence. So we have here that puzzle, right? The puzzle that puts EQ and IQ together. But, but what is EQ? Let's talk a little bit of what EQ measures. But well, let me, actually, I'm gonna just refer. Let me, let's talk a little bit about what IQ measures, right? IQ measures the ability to problem solve, use logic, understand and communicate complex ideas. That is the IQ. And what is EQ? And, and how does it come together? EQ is measuring emotions in people, recognizing emotions in people, recognizing emotions in ourselves. And how do we manage that? And how do we make decisions based on those emotions? And, and putting it together um, is, I, I think it's a great idea because IQ is something that we're born with. We, we, it doesn't, it's not created based on our life experience. It, it, it comes through, through our, our, you know, it, it's sort of our genetics. It's, it, it just comes through when we're born. Our EQ now on the other hand is it's created through our life experience. We may not be born with EQ, but we can, it can build and it can grow. And I think that is what is amazing about emotional intelligence is really understanding and building that social skill. And um, so I like the puzzle because I think it comes together uh, it's one because we need both. We need both to survive. We need emotional intelligence and we need our IQ so we can problem solve. This is how we survive in the world. Um, I will, so, so my work sort of comes through from Daniel Goldman. I, um, I enjoyed, this is where a lot of my dissertation and my literature review came from him and that's where it all started. And I, and I want to say uh, it, it sort of came about because maybe I am, I, I live in that space as well, but emotional intelligence really speaks to me. It speaks to me because it is, um, it, it's about people. It's about, you know, and I am a people's person. And so I, I want to speak a little bit about Daniel. Daniel Goldman is an author. He's a psychologist. He is He's the one who brought forth that movement of emotional intelligence in the 1990s. Um, and it came about as why, why it can matter more, why it's emotional intelligence matters most than IQ. And, and I just show, share that puzzle where I showed um, that we need, we can have, it, it matters more in, in, my, in my opinion, it matters more because it's something that can be created through life experience. 
you know, we're born with certain things, but then we get to build and get to build ourselves through EQ. And um, so I, I, I like Daniel Goldman because he talks about the focus and the driven excellence of, of, you know, of the work. And EQ creates persistence. It creates motivation. It creates grit. It, you know, it's all of the wonderful things that we look at when we think of leadership, when we think of people, you know, it sharpens our focus so we can deal with this complex world that we live in today. Um, EQ is about mindfulness. It's about willpower, all of the words that we need to be leaders. It's about leadership. It's about empathy. Those are all the things that we want to see in a leader. When we think of leaders, who do we want to be in front of? Who do we want to be our leader? Who do we want to guide us? So, um, so Daniel Gold Goldman really speaks to me because of his belief and his drive for that movement in the 1990s to the emotional intelligence movement. So um, I, I do want to, um, you know, I, I would like to pause here for a minute and see if there's any, if you have any questions for me or if it's okay for me to continue. Um, Kevin, is there any, anything in the chat or any uh, comments that you would like me to refer to? Uh, not yet. Um... I, I believe it, you're laying the foundation now for some of these concepts and probably questions will evolve as you get deeper into uh, this Okay. Topic. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, so why is it emotional intelligence so important? So it, it comes, you know, Daniel Goldman started that movement, but then, you know, we've Yale University have done some work in it and now Harvard Business Review speaks about emotional intelligence is a more powerful determinant of good leadership than technical competency, IQ, or vision. And I shared earlier that, you know, why is that? Why is good leadership, um, emotional intelligence, more powerful as a determinant of good leadership? Because it comes with empathy. It comes with social skills. We, when we lead, we lead people. We don't lead widgets. We lead people. You know, and so when we are working with people, we need to empathize with them. We need to be able to build that relationship. We need to socialize with them. We also need to understand their emotions and their life and what is going on. So, um, so that is why emotional intelligence is important. I wanna share a little um, snippet from the Harvard um, Business Review and a couple of just some quotes that I took from uh, in my reading. Um, about, you know, emotional intelligence and how leadership culture is important in employee experience. And it's really important that companies recognize the moments that matter to employees and provide them with help in a way that's convenient. And even more so in our pandemic, we have seen how important it is for people, um, dealing with people, dealing with ourselves in this time came out of nowhere, but it shows the importance of what emotional intelligence is. Um, I wanna share a couple more uh, from this article. And in today's on-demand, data-rich world, employees appreciate personalized interactions from their employers. Yet many organizations make the mistake of relying on traditional data source to better understand employees and improve experiences for them. People want that one-to-one. -one. They want you to get to know them. They don't want you, they're not data. They're not a data piece. They want that interaction. So, and, and, um, and companies have only just scratched the surface of potential to create a happier, more productive and purposeful driven workforce. And I, I wanted to share that with you because I wanna show why is emotional intelligence so important. It's about relationship. It's about people. It's about dealing with the social skills. So, um, so I want to also continue here with uh, Harvard's elements of emotional intelligence. So Daniel Goleman uh, talk about self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. Social awareness is about the empathy. Relationship management, social skills. 
um, you know, self-management is about really regulating yourself and being able to handle your own emotions. And self-awareness is being, knowing who you are. Um, so, um, so Daniel Golden, Goldman started off with the four uh, competencies, but as you can see, Harvard uh, Ellen, um, added some uh, core competencies and domains to the emotional intelligence. And on the self-awareness, uh, Harvard talks about, um, their studies spoke about the emotional self-awareness. You know, self-awareness is so important in knowing who you are and how you relate to others. Self-management, self-control, adaptability, achievement orientation, positive outlook. Those are all things that we need in order to be successful. And, do, and outside of you know success, we talk about success, but this is the things we need to just live, be in this world and integrate, be a citizen of, of, of this, uh, of our country, of our world. Um, social awareness, empathy, organizational awareness, empathy. How big is empathy today in the past year with our pandemic? How big is empathy? Um, how, how important is that in, in dealing with as leaders, understanding where your families are coming from, understanding where your staff members are, um, understanding the depth of their, their um, agony in, in losing a family member, right? So we need to always be in that space. And last but not least, our relationship management, influence, coaching and mentorship, teamwork, conflict management, inspirational leadership. Those are all important. And all of these, as even Daniel Goleman talks about the four uh, emotional intelligence domains, but these core competencies are bridge together all of the domains and show what we need as a person in order to be a successful leader. Uh, so I'm just gonna pause for a little quick of water, drink more of water, keep my mouth Getting dry. Uh, well, while you while you uh, pause for a second, um, I sure. thought that was a very uh, useful uh, graphic that you just had up that showed the four areas of EQ, um, these competencies that, that they're referred to, and the breakdown of the different components of that. You know, um, I just thought that to be very useful. Those twelve areas that really we all have to be aware of um, on a regular basis. And many of those areas could be areas that, that we didn't even know existed um, and maybe accidentally neglecting them, you know? So um, I thought, just thought that was, that's just a comment on that, that graphic. Yes, thank you for that, Kevin. And, and I do agree, we, we, we bypass it, right? We bypass it in our daily, but it's there and it lives with us every day. So, so why, why, um, why emotional intelligence? I could have written about anything, but why emotional intelligence? I spoke a little bit about my background as an educator. I spoke a little bit about my role as a principal, as a, a professor. Um, so what, what is my interest in emotional intelligence? You know, yes, it started off with Daniel Goleman, uh, it, his, his movement and who the talking about the four domains. And, and that's who I sort of, um, in my own way, you know, um, but, but why, why emotional intelligence? And I felt the reason I went in this direction is because I felt it's really important. It's important to my leadership role because I am working with people every single day in all of my roles, I'm working with people. Even in my family, I'm with a person, right? So it's, it's, it's interact, I go to the store, it's in, uh, I'm with, with people. So I'm always interacting with others in some way or another. And so what is EQ about? EQ is about us, about our, how we manage ourselves, how do we relate with others, right? Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship management, and, and also, I also work in a place where I want to be treated the way I treat people is the way I want to be treated. And so emotional intelligence is a personal, sit in a personal space for me because I, I want to be treated kindly. So I tend to give forth what I want. So, so that is why this really resonated with me, um, emotional intelligence, and I wanted to write about it because um, 
Look, highly effective leaders exhibit the strengths of the emotional intelligence competency. And that came from Goldman. And I truly believe that. And, and I, I sit in that place. Um, so, um, so that's why emotional intelligence. So I am gonna pause here for a quick second so I can get some, um, do some interaction with you. On a scale of one to five, with one being least and five being the most, how important do you think, um, how important is it for a leader within our public system to have emotional intelligence? I would love to hear from you. What do you think about emotional intelligence? And do you agree with where I am with emotional intelligence? Can you please put that in the chat? Yeah, Dr. Singh, we, we do have a couple of responses. Um, so uh, Kay has indicated five, um, I've indicated five, and then Nina, um, Dr. Beeman has also uh, indicated five. So um, out of everyone that's in the room, it's like uh, Patricia also uh, showed up and has indicated five. So you have a unanimous group of folks who all believe this to be very important for leaders to have. Yes, so I thank you for that. So this is going to be easy. We're going to be able to chat through this because um, we're all sitting in the same space and we're all on the same page. So thank you for your, your um, opinion on emotional intelligence. So, so let's speak now. I'm going to go into my uh, thesis inquiry and, and what, what I, I wrote about. And um, so the question I asked myself is, what is the impact of principles, emotional intelligence, leadership toxicity on school culture and on teacher self-efficacy? Because, you know, when I, when I also, when I did my study, I had just, I was in a, um, a leadership role, but I was not a principal at that time when I started my study. But when I, I wrote my dissertation, I, I had become a principal. So it was not the easiest task I want to share, but, um, but it really resonated with me because this is who I am. I'm, I'm writing about myself. I'm looking to see what do I need to do a better job? So I asked myself that question to see what was the results? What came out of my um, study? So um, today I will share three segments, um, uh, segment one, two, and three, and then we will also um, come to a conclusion of the study and talking a little bit about um, future exploration and, and what did I get out of this? or what did you get out of this? So in my first segments, we'll talk and look at the research questions, the definitions, uh, sample size, and my instruments. So what is my um, research question um, I asked myself, right? How to, so my study was in a New York City Department of Education schools, elementary, middle and high. And so I was looking at K to 12 teachers. So how do K to 12 teachers in New York City Department of Education describe their principles, emotional intelligence, their levels of toxic leadership, school culture and their own self-efficacy? So that was my first question. That's what I wanted to know. And then my second question was, is there a relationship among principles, a principal's emotional intelligence, level of toxic leadership, school culture, and teacher self-efficacy? And last but not least, I wanted to know to what extent are principals' emotional intelligence, level of toxic leadership, and school culture predictors of teachers' self-efficacy. So those were my research questions and, um, and that's what I wanted to know. So um, let's speak. So as we know, uh, um, you know, there's different variables um, for our studies. And I wanted to just share a little bit of the definition that I used for my study. Um, for emotional intelligence, I definitely took uh, Daniel Goleman uh, 2002, emotional intelligence is the ability to have increased social awareness, self-management, and relationship skills. I felt those were the, very important in my study. Uh, so what is toxic leadership? So I looked at emotional intelligence and toxic leadership because it, it's sort of on the opposite spectrum of each other. And um, so I wanted to see wh what role that play, if toxic leadership plays a role as well. And toxic leadership is a characteristic of those individuals in a leadership role who have serious enduring 
poisonous behavior because of their destructive behavior and dysfunctional qualities. And that was taken from Littman and Blumen, uh, 2005. And what is school culture? School culture in this study is the norms, the beliefs, and the tone of the school, an indication of how things are done at, at the school. And that is also taken from um, Peter Beale in 1998. And uh, self-efficacy is a judgment of one's ability to organize any given types of performance and exercise of con control. And I took that also from Bandura. Um, so these are the definitions of my variables, and these are my variables that I used in the study. So my sample size, um, you know, I surveyed 200 plus teachers in the K-12 school, elementary, middle, and high school, totaling 12 schools. And, um, and it was 202 teachers responded and was the sampling size that I chose from in order to um, continue my study. And I chose it from different districts as well. Um, I wanted to look at the different districts and how they impact each other. And um, so no protected class was affected by this data. It, there were teachers, there were adults, and um, they signed a consent to do the study. Um, I got permission from the principal to go into their schools to ask teachers for this uh, permission to do this, uh, fill out my survey. And um, so consent forms were provided. And it was a su survey and it was a qualitative study, quantitative study, sorry. It was a quantitative study. So um, my instrument was uh, uh, a survey and it measured the teacher's perception of the principal's intelligence, their levels of toxic leadership, school culture and lens of teacher self-efficacy. I also use a Likert uh, survey instrument, which was a uh, one to five ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree with five in the middle being neutral. Um, and I, I created items to use to measure emotional intelligence. So some of the items were created. Um, I cre created some, but some were taken from Bandura. Some were taken from every aspect, um, you know, Lippmann and Blumen. So I use uh, the different um, questions to create my, um, my items for the survey. So the, the ones that I created myself, was a jury validation because I had to test the reliability of those questions. And it was three peers who um, I worked with and they validated my, um, my items uh, in the survey. So the, and the items measured leadership was through Thoroughgood. Items from school culture was through Gernert and the ticker and self-efficacy was Bandura. And I really like Bandura's work also with self-efficacy. As you see, I use his, um, his uh, definition as well in, in my work. So um, I, I can pause there. Is there any question on my uh, segment one, looking at my questions? Is there anything you would like to ask me at this point or comment? I don't see anything in the chat, but someone could be uh, thinking just, I will say, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Singh, just type it in the chat um, and I can collect those and stop or pause her uh, depending upon any questions you have. Thank otherwise, you. otherwise you can continue Dr. Singh. Thank you. So my segment two will speak a little bit about the methodology and my statistical analysis and my results. What came out of my study? Um, so, so the methodology was based on literature review, right? My content validity was based on literature review. So, um, which is very important piece in any study. Um, so uh, my reliability, I did, it was an overall measurement of 0.96, which was an amazing um, reliability. Uh, it's only 0 0.04 away from 100%. So, um, so that is what, uh, you know, I continue my work based on that. The IRB conducted was a process to ensure that I protect the rights of the principals in this study because we're, 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 I was asking the teachers about their principals. So I really had to, um, it was anonymous and, and also the teachers were anonymous um, as I pulled their um, survey. 
it as a ram random sampling. The IRB approval was granted. Um, I wasn't able to do this work. I had to do two IRB, one for the uh, St. John's and one for also um, New York City Department of Education because I am working with their teachers, I'm working with their principals. So um, approval had to be given prior to me continuing this work. Um, and then I used the SPSS system for my factor analysis. So um, when I, for, so I had three questions uh, as I shared earlier and uh, my research question one, I did a descriptive analysis to, to to gain my um, my study, um, the response to my study. And then for question two, I use a correlation statistics as well as a partial correlation because I was looking at to see if toxic leadership was a mediator. And so I did a partial um, media, uh, a partial correlation to see if that they were, toxic leadership was really a mediator in the work that we do. And, and last but not least, for my question three, I did a multiple regression analysis for uh, question three. I am gonna pause for a minute, just to take a sip of water. Dr. Singh, uh, while you take a, a little breather there, um, I do wanna say that, you know, I was a school teacher for, you know, quite a while out in the public school, uh, actually it was uh, 10 years and it was elementary middle school. And um, I will say that during that time period, unfortunately, while you have quoted a bunch of research, you know, from the past, uh, this was not something that we talked much about. I mean, we didn't understand or know, or even, you know, see that as a variable. So um, I have some questions towards the end, which you may answer depending on some of your findings now, but it's interesting how I just wish we had known some of this, I guess, is some of my reflection when I was a, a school teacher, um, that this would have been helpful to know. Definitely, and as I will also share after my study, I will share some of the um, items from my literature review that I was able to pull out, I put to share with you, and you will see how important this work is. Um, and and, and uh, yes, I, I can see that because I'm also from the traditional school system. And so I didn't see some of this in when I was a student. So um, uh, Kay does have a question for you. Um, sure. And so Kay Bennett, she's, uh, she's wondering that if um, this might be addressed in the results, but she's wondering if toxic leaders were found to be missing one of those 12 elements of emotional intelligence from that chart um, in the beginning. So do you find that they miss one of those uh, 12 as part of her question, which you're probably going to maybe go in deeper in here in a second. And then also, is there a consensus that um, they all are missing some of these uh, in, in particular, like, are they all missing one, like empathy, you know, a common one, are they missing? And, and is, uh, or a multitude of elements. So that's generally uh, Kay's question. Are there certain elements that may, um, you know, pop up as a pattern with people who are toxic um, or, or missing because of folks who are toxic. Uh, and so maybe your findings will lean towards that. And when you get to that point, you can address case question in more detail. Thank you for the question, Kay. I wrote it down and I would like to ask if it's okay if I can't come back to that. I am going to share and I will come back to that graph and we will look at it together and we'll talk a little bit about that. Yep, she said, she said no problem. <laughs> Thank you. So in my findings, um, you know, identifying EQ and positive school culture. Um, so my findings shows a significant positive impact on teachers' self-efficacy. 26% uh, um, is if you have emotional intelligence as compared to a toxic leader. Um, and the school culture and, and emotional intelligence really leads to uh, a teacher's self-efficacy. But how, however, I found that toxic leadership had a significantly lower impact on teacher self-efficacy. And that is why I did the partial correlation because I wanted to see, yes, we saw the impact of emotional intelligence, but how, what was the impact on toxic leadership? And I will share some information in my lit review um, in a later slide, which was surprising to me. 
So I will also, and I also want to share that my publishing, this my findings is in my thesis and it was published in, um, in uh, 2017. But I will, let me share some additional uh, findings that I found um, in my study. So the positive correlation with emotional intelligence relative to the culture and teacher self-efficacy, and there was a positive correlation on school culture on teacher self-efficacy. So we saw that emotional intelligence really have an impact. We saw the school culture really has an impact uh, on teacher self-efficacy, right? So that was so important by the 26%. Um, positive school culture has a, a greater impact on teachers' uh, self-efficacy than emotional intelligence. So even though emotional intelligence was sitting at the top of this work, um, the, cell, the emotional intelligence created the school culture, which has a bigger impact on teacher self-efficacy. And we'll speak a little bit about that because I'll share that in my, um, in my uh, lit review. Uh, teacher self-efficacy can be predicted by e emotional intelligence and school culture. Emotional intelligence and school culture, um, you know, shows a 26% of the variance for teacher self-efficacy. So, so um, but, but surprisingly, look at the last one. Toxic leadership is not a major prediction, predictor. Toxic leadership is not a major predictor, but it's significantly negative on school culture and negative on teacher self-efficacy. So it has an impact, but uh, of course that is negative, but it's not a major predictor. And I will also talk a little bit about that in my lit review, which was also surprising to me. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about segment three. What does all this mean? What is my, talk a little bit of my conclusion and future exploration. And, um, and then I will also come back to case question because I, I would like to review that in looking at those competencies for Harvard um, shared with us. So, so one of the things that really drove my work as well, and um, I, I wanna speak a little bit about it is trust. What is the importance of trust? And I, I, this uh, is the framework for great schools because that was really my, as much as we talk about leaders, my focus was in the school system, but I'm speaking with leadership. Leadership is leadership, whether in a school system, whether in corporate America, whether anywhere. Uh, but I, my work was kind of driven through looking at this framework for great schools because I, I worked for the New York City Department of Ed at that time and then I wanted to really focus on BRIC's work. And if you see here, it's um, BRIC talks about trust. Look, we have student achievement in the middle. We talk about supportive environment. We talk about rigorous instruction, collaborative teachers, which all comes through self-efficacy. We'll be talking about effective leadership, strong family ties, but, but surrounding all of that is trust. And, and that was the big piece in my study of trust, the element of trust and the importance. And where does that come from? And that is what drives the school culture, is that trust. If we don't trust, we can't build relationship. If we don't trust, we can't have empathy. Right, we, we, we list all, all of those things. And, 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 and that may be an answer to Kay's question as well, right? What is the toxic leader uh, missing in, in the work that we do? And, and I will come back to that question. So let's talk a little bit about leadership and what did I pull out of my, uh, of my work? Um, you know, some of the points that I would like to share. Good leaders are made not born. I really want to share that. We are not born good leaders. We can become good leaders. And we can become good leaders by building our emotional intelligence. As we talked about earlier, emotional intelligence is based on our life experience in, in what we have gone through. So good leaders are made, not born. Having empathy, building relationships, that is what makes leadership. There are so many leaders. There are different types of leaders, right? We have strategists, we have innovative, we have 
uh, communicators, we have coaches. But if we don't have empathy, building relationship, open communication, transparency, consistency, those are all qualities that we look for in leaders. Uh, leaders need to be trusted to build school culture of collaboration. Trust, teacher self-efficacy will increase. Trust is mentioned throughout, demonstrating honesty, building relationship. So, so these are the qualities we need from leaders. So again, I will come back to, to what is a toxic leader missing in, in leadership. Um, toxic leadership, let's talk a little bit about that. They're destructive to their organization. They are leaders, anyone can lead. There's many people who lead who don't have emotional intelligence. And there are many people who lead who have emotional intelligence, but the, the destruction to their organization are the people who are toxic. They abuse their powers and they leave the organization worse than they found it. You know, they, they are, they come in and they just, they, they have, they, they build their own agenda. Negative impacts creates a survival in human, positive impact need for stability. So I talk a little bit about that because what I found in my study, which was very surprising to me, is teachers will not leave a school, even though they may have a principal or a leader who has toxic leadership behavior. They will not. And I thought that was interesting because I was like, why not? You know, there are many schools. Why don't you go to another school? But a teacher become a teacher, not for the leader. A teacher becomes a teacher for their students, for themselves, what they can give to the students. So what happens when there's a toxic leader, they just create that space where they can work with their students and give to them what they are about. What did they, what did they, why did they become a teacher? So I found that very surprising, but I could understand. Because, um, you know, especially being in the school system, teachers really about their students' achievement. That's why they do what they do on a daily basis. Um, you know, and I talked a bit about here, unexpectedly, employees in school settings will stay in a job due to caring about students' success and the love of teaching. Why they do this? Subordinates tolerate and accept leaders with toxic behavior. They just work around them. They just find that space that works for them because the leader is not why they're there. So let's talk a little bit about the big thing, school culture that drives self-efficacy as we talked about, and that is the work that we're looking for, right? Because self-efficacy drives student achievement. The need for positive environment, sense of belonging, the order for teaching and learning to take place. That is what builds culture. Culture is shaped through disposition, values. Culture is created through rituals, honoring our, our teachers, recognizing them, appreciating them, celebrating them, and students as well. It's, it's culture is not, we talk about teachers, but it's about everyone in that school. The norms, how do we do, what do we do there? What do we do in this place? What does it look like, right? Sharing our mission and vision. But as we talked about earlier, it's not about the IQ and the vision, it's about emotional intelligence. So that is what creates that culture. So good leaders have, and good leaders have the power to change an organization. Better leaders have the power to change people. That is what it's about. It's about people. Principals have to create the conditions where learning is happening. That's why they're there. That's why we're there. That's why this is important because I sit in this space. I'm speaking about me. I'm not speaking about someone who's outside. I am speaking about me being part of that, that sense of belonging, that sense of wanting to do better. Teachers are able to be efficient in a culture where trust brings consistency, compassion, communication, and competency. So these were the findings that I found. Um, you know, these were the things 
that um, in my variable that I thought was so important. And last but not least is the self-efficacy. What are the outcomes that are based on self-efficacy? People may have skills, but may not be able to perform adequately. But when you trust them and you bring them in and you create that space for them to grow, they will do, they will show you who they are and they will give you what is, is theirs to give. Because we, we, heard, we saw they became teachers for a reason. The students are what are important to them. So that is why they do the work. So the greatest predictor of teacher self-efficacy was the sense of school culture, that sense of belonging, wanting to be there. Efficacy builds when resources are provided, flexibility in classroom, teachers appreciated, inspired, student discipline is minimal. Though that is where that efficacy builds, right? That you don't have to, you don't have to create that space where you 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 just love what you do. You're given everything you need to do the job that you want to do. Teachers' efficacy is related to student outcome, like academic achievement. That's why they do what they do. Teachers want to be uh, supported because they want to support their students. High level of self-efficacy is shown when teachers have control over the school policy. And a lot of schools, I, um, you know, like in, in speaking of my school, uh, we have a school leadership team uh, where teachers have a voice. Collaboration, being part of a cabinet, being part of that leadership team that speaks and make decision for the schools. Those are all quality um, situation that teachers want to be in so they can show who they are and be part of a place and create a space for their students that they love. So today's learning objective for, for our presentation is what is emotional intelligence and why is it so important and explaining the need for the study and why is the study so important. But I will come back to that. I want to address um, Kay's question on toxic leadership. So, so what, are the, what is the missing element for um, a toxic leader? And I will say, and, and, and I would love if you could put it in a chat based on what you heard, everyone, if anyone want to just respond to that. What is the missing element for a toxic leader? Anyone wants to take uh, a go with that? Kevin, did anyone take a go with that? Nalini, can you put back up those 12 things? Uh, so we I will, I will come back to that, yes. Each of the 12, yeah. Yeah, so let me go back to that. Sorry about that, but I- No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> 12. I did write down the four competencies. And so, <laughs> you know, even it could be that broad, you know, is there a certain competence? There we go. So here we go. Sub competency there might be missing. So let's look at that. Self-awareness, emotional self-awareness. Self-management, self-control, adaptability, achievement orientation, positive outlook, social awareness, empathy, organizational awareness, relationship management, influence, coach and mentor, conflict management, teamwork, inspirational leadership. What do you think is missing from um, a toxic leader? So Kevin, once it, it shows up, because I'm not able to see the chat. Yep, we, yep, we got a couple of folks in there now. Uh, Kay thinks it's social awareness. Um, I, put that, I put that it's emotional self-control, maybe a deficiency that someone who's toxic, you know, exhibits or, or doesn't exhibit, I guess we would say. Okay, thank you for, for sharing. Um, Definitely emotional self-control uh, is there. Empathy definitely is there because they haven't built that. But, but I also feel a, a bigger piece, we talk about trust. And because of their lack of self-control, lack of empathy, you know, they have the influence. They have the influence, but are they part of their team, right? Are they part of that team? Are they inspirational? Do they coach? Do they mentor? 
but they're lacking trust. And if you're lacking trust, I talk about trust being that overarching uh, umbrella um, of, of, of that circle. If you're lacking any of these, uh, uh, competencies, you will be lacking trust. And trust is the big piece in doing, working with others. If we don't trust someone, even in our daily lives, right? Outside of leadership, outside of anything, you know, having that belief that someone has your back, uh, right? That trust that someone will always cover you. If, if we don't see that, if we don't feel that, um, we can't go further. And I think that is what, because of a toxic leader, um, so let's look back at that, what a toxic leader bring to the table, right? They bring, um, a toxic leader, they abuse their power. They leave the organization worse than they found it, right? They, those are not emotional intelligent qualities. So I think what a toxic leader is missing is emotional intelligence overall. They're missing the social awareness to understanding how their behavior is impacting others. They're missing the uh, self-regulate management self regulating their behavior and their emotion because they continue to abuse their power. They are missing the, um, the self, um, I'm sorry, let me take a sip of water. That empathy, hold on a second, please. That social awareness, that empathy, they're missing that because they are not understanding what others are going through. And they're last but not least, they're missing that relationship management. Uh, they're not able to build that relationship because they are abusing their power. They're not there to build relationship. They're, be, they're there to just build their own agenda. And if you're building your agenda, you're not about a relationship. So what I would say toxic leaders are missing, as uh, Kay asked, is missing all of the elements and they're missing emotional intelligence. And, um, and, and so they're missing the consensus, consensus is they're missing all of the basis of emotional intelligence, of, of the core competencies of emotional intelligence. Dr. Singh, yes. uh, as I looked at that, those 12, you know, domains and competencies in that graph, um, I was, you know, thinking to myself, because I know we were looking at, are there areas of deficiency? And it sounds like people who are toxic, which would be on the extreme of the continuum, you know, uh, That's of, correct. of maladaptive leadership, then um, those folks are missing a little bit of everything. Now they might yes. not be missing everything uh, to where they have nothing, but they, they are missing and deficient in enough of those that the combined effect resu results in their toxicity. Um, but here was really my reflection is while we're talking about things are missing, could some of their toxicity be the result of them overemphasizing one of those 12 things? And that, that circle is actually bigger than all the other circles. And because of their excessive attention on that one circle, and the one that I think about when I think of toxic leaders as their driver, it's achievement orientation is the only thing that's important to them. That like, is correct. Get things done by any means necessary. necessary. And so they overemphasize that bubble at the expense of the other 11. And so I was just curious, did you see any stuff like that, um, you know, through some of your research? So I, that was not one of the focus, um, one, because I was really looking at emotional intelligence, but I do agree with you. And I thank you for bringing that to, to the point because I, they're not missing all of it. They're just missing bits and pieces of that. Because we, we, emotional intelligence is having those domains and those competencies. But that doesn't mean if you're missing one of it, that you mean you don't have some form of emotional intelligence, right? You, you, it, it's not a, a yes or a no, it's not to the extreme. But, but I do agree with you, Kevin, about the um, toxic leaders needing that, it, they're task oriented and they just wanna get it done. They're there to do a job. They're not there to build relationship. They're not there. They're not thinking that a relationship can get their job done in a better and a quicker way. You know, you can do both. 
you can build relationship and have empathy and all of the um, domains and, and still get the job done. And it might actually work out better for you. So, but they're not in that space. That is not their objective. Okay, so Pat McAfee, she has a question too, and she says that generations and cultural expectations are always changing. And did you see a difference in your study related to any generational differences? So maybe uh, folks who were of the older uh, regime, the older principals, the older teachers, um, this toxicity was maybe more tolerated because that's just the way it's always been. Um, and maybe for the new folks who were coming in, they were less tolerant of that or they were less, uh, you know, they had less grit, like you mentioned, and that negatively affected them more than maybe the veterans who had more time to, to you know, tolerate that in some way. Um, so I did not look at that specifically. It, go ahead. Sorry, Kevin. Did I, did you? Did no, I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, generational differences. Did you notice any generational differences between? So I'm going to write that down as well. And um, so I did not um, look at genera generational differences, but I will speak a little bit of my experience in answering that question. So I, um, you know, I am only 24 years old. <laughs> However, I've spent a good amount of time in this world. So, of course, I'm not 24. But so I was in the system a very long time. I worked for New York City Department of Education. And I have seen the shift of, of how we did things back in the days to how we do things now. And definitely... Um, toxic leadership, and, and I don't want to use it in such a broad term because I don't want to say that the leaders back then was uh, toxic, but, but they did not have all of the emotional intelligence uh, domain and competencies that we are looking at today. And I think it's because it was not required. I really believe that is not something we looked, we, we, we think about, right? Back in the days, it was getting the job done. Now we're thinking more about people. Now we're thinking about how we feel. We're thinking with mindfulness. We're thinking about SEL. Those are the things that are coming forth from because of our life experiences, because of our world that we are living in. Look at what the pandemic has brought to us, right? So that pandemic, the pan pandemic has shifted even more so um, what, what we're gonna be looking for in emotional intelligence. So definitely in the past, I I'm not saying that they didn't have emotional intelligence. I don't think it was required because the goal was different. Uh, people's expectations were different. It was about doing the job. I'm going to work to do a job. I am, you know, the students when I was in school, it was very traditional um, learning, get the job done, come in, sit, learn. T today, it's not about that. Today, we look at students, we look at where they're coming from, we look at their home lives, we look at their parents, we, we, um, we look at students holistically. You know, it's, it's not about a job anymore, it's about caring, it's about being aware, it's about understanding. Um, those are the, the words that come to me, but empathy. What is empathy today? How important it is? You know, so, so, so yes, um, Patricia, um, yes, um, toxic leadership, I, I wouldn't say it was evident back there. It was just not, uh, emotional intelligence was not looked upon. And we saw also Daniel Goleman, this came forth more in 1990s when he started that movement that emotional intelligence was more uh, matters more than IQ, because it, it matters. It didn't matter back then. It matters now. And that is why this work is so important. That is why there's a need for this study and why my study is important, because it matters now. It's about relationship. It's about people. What is our most precious commodity, our children? It's about bringing them up, understanding them, teaching them, helping them to be adults. That is what we're doing today. We're not traditionally just teaching them. And yes, you pass a test and you go on. That is not what school is about anymore. School is about encompassing that whole child, understanding them, right? So, so today's learning objective was about what is emotional intelligence? In, emotional intelligence is, is those 12 competencies with those four domains, social awareness, social management. 
empathy. We do have Thank another you. question um, in the chat uh, from Dr. Beeman. And so uh, she says that she's worked with a toxic supervisor once before. Um, she didn't know it wasn't me, <laughs> which I'm happy to know. Uh, whenever, whenever she would have a meltdown, the supervisor of Nina, um, all the employees would have to be forced to take emotional intelligence courses. And these courses made those uh, in that group uh, with high EQ aware of what we were missing in the culture. So as a result of this training, it actually brought an awareness of all the pieces that were missing in their culture. But, but Nina uh, indicates that, uh, however, we all compensated for her, that supervisor with low EQ, by providing emotional support to the students and staff instead of her. And do you think um, a good follow-up would be to examine a compensatory behaviors on employees who work for leaders with low EQ? So it, it, it would be interesting to see the impact um, and, and how, uh, how the employees compensate with support systems to actually help maybe that toxic leader navigate their toxicity better. Um, but yes. you know, in, that, in Nina's situation, it never really changed the toxic person. It just made those who were around that toxic person alter their behavior um, in a way that, that uh, supported folks who were being damaged by that toxicity. So as soon as you said that, so Nina, thank you for sharing that. But as soon as you said that, my thought was, was, was the toxic leader in that training with you? Right. And from what oh, yeah, it, it became a joke after a while. She'd have a <laughs> meltdown and we'd all look at each other like, oh no, we got to do EQ training. I think the the upward leadership were trying to impress upon her and said to her, you need to take EQ training as though that would magically help. And instead she sort of forced all of us to do it. Um, I, and that's that lack of self-awareness. Yes. That she, and by the way, this was not Aspen University, but she never saw herself as the problem ever. So, so, um, so that's why social awareness is the first domain. It sits there. And I just find that amazing because she thought it was everyone else but her, but she is the driving force. She is the leader. She, she carries that organization. So, so I really thank you for sharing. And you, you, you know, and, and Nina, it was not a plant here today, I, I assure you, but you show why emotional intelligence and leaders are important, um, that they have to be aware of themselves. And it's not everyone else but you. But even if I felt it was everyone, I would still be in there with you. I would still be in that training with you because we are a team. And that shows in itself that she did not have that, she's missing that, um, that, that those competencies of um, even that self-awareness, let's start there, that social awareness, because she didn't even know that she had to be part of that and that she is the one who drives the work and she's the one who drives that school culture. I mean, that, that culture of that organization, you know, so, so that's, that's a big piece. And um, so I apologize for that, but that is why we see why this work is so important. There is a need and people need to be aware and we need to share this. This, this. this is what is important. And that is why is emotional intelligence so important is that we don't have um, Nina and her, her uh, colleagues having training when the, prince, the, the leader is just sitting outside watching that or checking off a box and saying, this was done at my organization, right? We have to jump in and we have to be part of that team. We have to collaborate together. So, um, uh, Kay, Kay does have another question, um, and this was something that I was thinking about uh, as you went through your presentation as well, where we collected survey data from the 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 um, teachers and you know that that were in that school district about the leadership style of the principal. Um, but I was wondering, did any of that have an impact on student learning? And that sort of is where. Kay's question is going, and she says, I know school scores um, aren't great predictors for success, but did the school districts or teachers um, or schools 
with the greater school culture, the better school culture, also have higher scores as a result of the teacher's higher efficacy? So, so I did not look at that. Um, I did not look at that because I was, I wanted this as sort of a, a joke for me because I wanted to look at a quantitative and a qualitative study so I can encompass everything in my study. But I, you know, I was told that the best dissertation is a completed dissertation. And so I will look to do that as a future study. I will um, definitely take that uh, as a future, future work because I really also wanted to hear from the principal if they felt what the teacher said about them was, you know, was actually, did, did, the, did my data triangulate? So, so that was important to me, but I haven't gotten to that place yet. And, um, and I don't have that information, but I will tell you what, if you can reach out to me, I will share my um, email address, or if you can share yours, either way, I will get back to you on that response, or I can get back to everyone on that response, because I will look at the spe specific schools and um, just give um, um, sort of look at that data if that worked. Um, I, emotional intelligence of the principals made a difference in the higher schools. Study shows it does. The, the study shows that teacher self-efficacy does drive student achievement. Um, however, for the specific schools, I do not have that data at this time. Yeah, and you don't know which maybe is affecting the other. Maybe, you know, uh, because my students are successful, I am a happier person. Therefore, I'm less toxic, you know, and because my students aren't doing well and I'm less self-efficacy, you know, lower on that. Then, I'm, then as a result, I sort of create that reality. So anyway, Dr. Singh, I, I just want to uh, let you know we have about five minutes um, left. And so I just want to give you the opportunity to finish whatever you want to talk about. And thank you for letting, you know, the folks uh, ask some questions uh, at that point. Definitely. And I thank you for sharing and, and um, asking your questions because it builds, um, you know, it's interactive. And you don't have to hear my voice only throughout this uh, presentation. So just to wrap up, how did this work extend into real life and my profession and future explorations? But I talk about how this has worked for me, how this has done, you know, why I feel this emotional intelligence is important. But, but there is a need for empathy and compassion. And, and I see that every day, and especially now, right? EQ in leading is important for students and teachers. So I, I think for the future, EQ training is part of a leadership program. I put that in my dissertation as well. Leadership programs should have some EQ training or bring that out or let that be some awareness. There should be workshops to build on your EQ competencies. And also, uh, we have young ones coming up. We talk about our precious commodities, right? They're coming up, they're students, they're children. They're gonna grow up eventually. SEL training for students, embedding that EQ competency so that when they become adults or they become leaders, it's already ingrained in them, it's part of them. And so I, I'm also um, writing an article on the escalated need for emotional intelligence and in principles, because I feel especially post pandemic, this is so important that we, we have, what is, what is September going to be like? What is now? But our students, when they come back into the building, when they're in front of us, when they come with everything that this past year has given them, um, what, how do we relate to them? How do we work with them holistically? You know, so what is the need? What does our leaders need to have in order to guide that school culture and build that teacher self-efficacy to ensure that student achievement is impacted? which is the basis of our work. So I wanna thank you for sharing today. I wanna to thank you for being interactive. Thank you for joining, Kevin. Thank you for being my, my, my uh, side partner in this work and um, just and giving me that opportunity to share today. So I wanna thank everyone for being here and spending their time with me, their past hour. And I wanna share my contact information. So um, nalini.singh at aspen.edu. If you have any questions or you want to remain in contact or you just want to, um, you know, something you may have thought of as you walked away from today, um, thinking, please reach out to me, please join me. And I would love to continue this conversation because this is a passion for me. I love the work I do. And um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And have a wonderful weekend. Real, real quickly, Dr. Singh, um, I do want to say thank you for mentioning that where you're inviting folks to seek 
partnership and collaboration with you in the future or even currently on questions they have because that is part of the, uh, the purpose of the colloquium is to bring us together and where we have common interests and curiosities possibly in research then we can maybe combine our efforts and maybe co-publish and do these kinds of things um, in different environments and really propel some of this research to the forefront because it's so important like you mentioned and yet it's one of the things that I kept thinking about as you presented Nalini and, and the presentations yesterday which there's a lot of commonality in what you were mentioning and what we notice in the nursing environments yeah. sometimes that result in, in burnout and etc and um, you know one thing that was common was that we sometimes stay in our job and tolerate toxicity because we care for our patients or we care for our students yeah. and we are there for that reason um, and that but yet we will tolerate you know, that environment and do some of the things that Nina said, where we even go compensate for that leadership, you know, uh, deficiency. I think in teaching, it can sometimes be easier to tolerate uh, a toxic principal um, than maybe in a, a hospital wing. Um, of course. And why is because in a school, you know, uh, I can go into my classroom and keep all adults. And it's just me and my students and I don't have to put up with all the politics that principal will not come into my room and interrupt my instruction and bother me or do anything right. Yeah. In a hospital environment or even a work environment, you sometimes cannot get away from the people who are toxic. That's correct. In school, I can escape them in my classroom and only interact with them when I'm neat when I force uh, forced to so um, before I get off, I kind of want to summarize some of your talking points a little bit Dr. Singh. Um, sure. You, you mentioned that emotional, uh, you know, intelligence, the emotional quotient, is so it's, it's, it's also called, um, is made up of four competencies, um, self-awareness, self-management, relationship management, and social awareness. And, and I noticed there's a pattern there. Two of those talk about uh, awareness, and two of those talk about management. So we have to be aware of something and then we got to intentionally go manage it, right? And the two areas that we're being aware, aware of and managed were myself, I'm self-aware and self-managing and then others. So there's social awareness and relationship managing. And so that I believe is a great way to think about it. You know, yes. uh, it's just me managing and being aware of my own self and me managing and being aware of others and their emotions and behaviors that that can help make that a little more practical in terms of implementation. If we try to remember those 12 things, it'll be too hard. But if we can just break it down into something as simple as, you know, it's self-management and, and awareness and other management and awareness, then, then it's a little easier. Um, I thought it was, was interesting too, your work on um, self-efficacy. Uh, you mentioned Bandura. Is that uh, Albert Bandura that you were mentioning? Yes. Okay. I liked his work. He did a lot of stuff uh, with vicarious learning. And, you know, it was a little yes. kid that go punch the Bobo doll. And then all of a sudden now they're more violent when they watch someone else punch it. <laughs> yeah, of course. I was wondering if it was the same guy. Um, but, but I think as well that you really made this emphasis is that leading takes work. Yes. People aren't just born to be leaders. You know, this stuff is intentional. You have to be aware, right? Awareness yeah. is one of these competencies. You have to be aware of this and make a management, right? Effort to go do stuff related to it. So that was just sort of important to me um, that, that we know this is something that we can control and it's not, well, he just is a good leader and I'm not. And therefore he, he was gifted and born that way or that something. That is correct. That is uh, correct. Okay, I don't have uh, many questions because you allowed us to sort of answer those uh, or ask those, I should say, throughout. But um, I guess the interesting thing was too that school culture, culture was the biggest, most important thing that affected teacher efficacy. Definitely. And leadership is what affects that culture. That is correct. Being aware of those 12 components um, and then managing those 12 components is part of being a good leader to minimize toxicity, increase um, employee or teacher self-efficacy, and then more ultimately um, impact student learning. Uh, yes. That's what all of this is supposed to do. So uh, Dr. Singh, uh, great work, great research. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing and making an impact in your profession. 
And I know that you have uh, taken to heart much of your research um, as you go in daily and interact as a principal with your teachers in order to create that culture, in order to help them feel um, high on their self-efficacy. Definitely. And, and I bet you have uh, very low turnover as a result. Definitely. I don't. Uh, I don't. Empowered, and that's why they are successful. So it all starts with leadership. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope to see you in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes at our second session, which will um, continue to talk about the characteristics of teachers and the setting and how that impacts uh, their, their interest in continuing in the profession. Thank you, everyone. And I thank you. And I think maybe, Nina, if you want to join together in doing some work, I would love to continue that work looking at the yes. employees. You bet. We're okay, a team. Email me. Email me right. your uh, contact, and I would love to do some work looking at that. And thank you also for, I think Patricia shared some generational differences. So I will continue to do this work. So thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. Great nope. presentation. Thanks. Bye, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Kevin, thank you. No problem. Talk to you later. Okay, bye-bye.